welcome to this week's edition of World Crisis Radio. This is Webster Tarpley reporting here from a snowy Washington, D.C., a thin coating of snow over the nation's capital, despite the fact that it's the first day of spring. Now, we have a a busy program today. We're following, once again, a whole bunch of struggle situations, and we'll try to get to those uh, as we can. But let's, first of all, make some obvious points about foreign policy. (coughs) Pardon me. Concerning the Israeli elections and Netanyahu. Now, uh, Netanyahu, of course, qualifies as a warmonger, demagogue, and he uh, shamelessly engages in displays of racism uh, vis-a-vis the Arab citizens of Israel. There are Arab Israelis um, who represent a significant political bloc in the uh, parliament there, the Knesset. Uh, Netanyahu, obviously uh, a racist and uh, at the same time someone who has built his political career on war and the threat of war. Now, this is intolerable. And we have to remember that the only reason that that Netanyahu can do these things is because he gets this $3.5 billion subsidy from the United States uh, in terms of military aid and other aid. Uh, remember that the, the Iron Dome which uh, with this, the anti-missile system that has allowed the most recent uh, excesses by Netanyahu was also a joint project with the U.S. and heavily funded by the U.S. So the question now arises uh, how to restrain, how to uh, mute the excesses of Netanyahu. Because remember, this is now an attempt to drag the United States into war really on two fronts, right? One is the Iranian front, where he has been focusing with his demagogy in his uh, speech to the U.S. Congress, and then also vis-a-vis the Palestinians. Um, The Iran demagogy we've discussed in previous weeks, but now concerning the Palestinians, on the eve of the election, as everybody now knows, uh, Netanyahu said, if you create a Palestinian state, uh, then you're simply uh, creating a playground for uh, Islamic uh, fundamentalist extremists. And uh, the, the question then, does that mean that, you, that under your prime ministership there won't be a Palestinian state? The answer, indeed. Now, after having harvested, having reaped the fruits <coughs> of that demagogy, Netanyahu then attempted to reverse his field in the famous interview with Andrea Mitchell uh, on the day after the vote, saying, I have not changed my policy. I don't want a one-state solution. I want a two-state solution, but it has to be uh, viable and with security guarantees and all this. Now, of course, <laughs> from the point of view of the insider, I suppose, or just an outsider, who knows something, that I guess would be my attempt. Uh, it's true, he hasn't changed his policy. Everybody always knew that Netanyahu was a warmonger and that he was inalterably opposed to peace because he's built his political career on the opposite. So there really is nothing new. Uh, the point is, though, that he has now made it impossible for his enablers in the U.S., in the State Department, and the Obama administration, even his enablers can now not defend what he's done because he says, well, we're we're not going to have a Palestinian state. I have not had a chance to to look it all up, but the the idea of a Palestinian state uh, was at least implicit in the Camp David Accords of Carter and uh, Begin and Sadat in uh, 1978. And... Uh, it was explicit in the Oslo Accords that were celebrated at the White House by Bill Clinton uh, with uh, uh, Rabin and uh, Arafat uh, in, what, 94, I guess it must have been. Uh, and we've had others, right? We've had Y River. We've had other uh, interim 
uh, agreements. The the entire bedrock of the entire policy uh, really can only be the two state solution, right? This also grows out of UN uh, resolutions 242 and so forth, right? So um, there's no doubt that the two state solution is indispensable. It's the only one that would ever work, right? Uh, and that is that goes against the various extremist radicals who want the one state solution and then the the demographic uh, takeover, right? Which um, it would would obviously generate many other problems. So uh, by saying this, Netanyahu has exposed himself. He was essentially a crypto warmonger, if you want, if you were willfully blind. But now uh, he's now an open uh, warmonger. So this makes it impossible uh, to uh, to support him. I would also add maybe a little bit more substantively from the U.S. Uh, population point of view, the idea of forcing this country into a war with Iran, which could easily become a war with others. Let's not even speculate which others, but there are others, and you can imagine who. <coughs> Those are very, very dangerous activities, and they're intolerable. So um, you know that I have uh, long um, contemplated and to some degree endorsed the idea – it's really the same idea that, that Franklin D. Roosevelt had in 1944 and 1945 concerning the United Nations, right? The Security Council, as FDR put it, was the five policemen. And the idea was you would have an international regime of peace and security that could uh, act against threats. And you can act in, in a number of ways. Um, I think it is time for some of these smaller countries to be restrained and to be uh, essentially guided, no lanes, vo lanes, right, willy-nilly, towards these peaceful solutions. In other words, it is intolerable for a petty tin pot demagogue in a tiny country to threaten the peace of the world in this way, to say nothing of the humiliation to the United States and, and all the rest of it. But the main thing is, the peace of the world. So I actually suggest uh, if we had a Russian-U.S. condominium, it would be fairly easy to say to Israel thus far and no farther to say to China, uh, you know, cool it on those islands. That's going to be somehow mediated to say to Ukraine, cool it, uh, time to pull in your horns and so forth. Um that sounds a bit utopian. I don't think it is. That was the other big idea of Franklin D. Roosevelt was that within that world of the five policemen, you could have uh, a special U.S.-Russian condominium that would allow precisely problems like this to be dealt with. In other words, the general outlines of the peace accord are clear. They are codified in the fall 2003 Geneva Accords of Yossi Balin and Yasser Abed Rabo, done, what, 12 years ago now? And uh, they're clear. We won't go through them now. Go and look at them. Uh, those are the ones that I more or less uh, endorse, although I always want to make sure you add the Marshall Plan for the Middle East. I spent some time contemplating Netanyahu's objection to see if it was fair, because on, on the surface he seems to have a case. When right? he says if you had an independent Palestinian <coughs> state, then uh, ISIS would be there, Al-Qaeda would be there. And I have come to the conclusion that that is uh, not a valid explanation for reasons which I will tell you in just a minute. Welcome back to the World Crisis Radio. Webster Tarpley here in Washington, D.C. So what to do about Netanyahu? Um my recommendation to Obama would be the following. In a confidential way, through diplomatic channels, behind closed doors, communicate to the Israeli government and to the elite of Israel through personal contacts that Netanyahu is simply unacceptable. The form that this could take is a veto 
veto Netanyahu, announce the uh, conclusion of the United States government that the paramount fundamental national interests of the United States are outrageously threatened by Netanyahu as an individual, as a demagogue, as a person, a warmonger, a focus of uh, subversive activities, activities subversive of international peace and security. And therefore, Netanyahu is not acceptable to the United States as the prime minister. And with all due respect to these elections, uh, we know that the Israeli elections are exorbitantly uh, influenced by people like Sheldon Adelson and other rich Americans who always come down on the side of the warmonger, the reactionary, the provocateur, the uh, exponent of bluster and aggression and so forth. And in our generation, that's been this uh, Netanyahu. He's unacceptable. Now, there are two orders of leverage to back this up. One, of course, is the diplomatic one. Uh, it's long been the case that the United States has been the only barrier between the outrage of the rest of the world, and that's the only way to put it, the rest of the world, with almost no exceptions, and uh, people like Netanyahu. So, indeed, in the Security Council, it would be good to see an early raising of this question, should there be a Palestinian state, and therefore have the UN Security Council vote for it. The United States, of course, can abstain, abstain, but not veto it. And with that, it will go through, because even the British and the French are going to vote for it, depending on, of course, on how it's phrased. But generally speaking, they will vote for it. The other uh, line of uh, leverage, of course, is the $3.5 billion in aid given by the United States to Israel. Um, it might be time to slow down on some of those deliveries, right? It might be a good time to manifest uh, this uh, view, this finding, that Netanyahu is a threat to world peace as an individual, right, just as, as a person. And he must no longer be allowed to have access to these levers of, uh, of power. I think it is time to say that um, these smaller countries with unstable politics and demagogic uh, leaders, right? In other words, you look at you look at Ukraine, right? The whole policy is based the politics of the country is based on Russophobia. We cannot allow that to interfere with the peace of the world and impose a world war on the United States because we don't want a world war. We are sick of war and we're not taking it anymore. <laughs> And that would go for Netanyahu, and that would go for some others, too. And I would urge uh, anybody involved in those little islands there in the South China Sea to also back off, be it Japan or China, Vietnam, um, Taiwan, uh, all, please, back off. The United States will not be a party to this. On the other hand, we also will uh, severely frown on people coming in there, because Japan is, is after all, right there. Um, what is, is it unprecedented? Well, no, it used to be, you know, with elections, there used to be elections with a veto, uh, the papal conclaves. Hey, the papal conclave, for example, of 1903, only yesterday, 100 years ago, a little bit more, uh, the papal conclave of, of 1903, uh, the leading candidate was an Italian cardinal called Rampolla. Rampolla, he was the secretary of state. In the Vatican, he was a disciple of the outgoing, uh, then deceased Pope Leo the Thirteenth. He was the mentor of Benedict the Fifteenth, the Pope that came after him. But this series was interrupted when the Cardinal of, uh, I think, of Galicia, actually, uh, but in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, uh, the Cardinal of Krakow, I believe, uh, got up and read a veto message from Franz Josef the emperor of Austria, saying that the election of Rampolla is unacceptable to the Austrian Empire. And, of course, the Spanish king, the French king, and the Austrian emperor had long uh, asserted this right uh, to, uh, to a veto, even though it was contested. Rampolla was considered pro-French <coughs> as a result, <coughs> pardon me, as a result of the... Um, 
of this veto, uh, Rampolo was not elected, and we had Pius X, and I think this is a negative page in the history of the papacy, Pius X and his cardinal, Marie del Val, who was his uh, secretary, at, uh, secretary of state. All right, so here's an example of a veto. This one turned out poorly, but uh, I think a veto of uh, Netanyahu could turn out to be quite uh, quite um, positive, if only in the sense that it would avoid the worst. Because what's he going to do now? Um, will there be a new intifada? Uh, will the Palestinians rise up? Will the PLO be overthrown? Remember, the PLO is based completely on this idea that you can have a negotiated solution. And now Netanyahu says essentially, I fooled you for 20 years. Well, you didn't fool anybody, but everybody played along. Now you've made it impossible for them to play along. And uh, and what's left? Will there be violence? Will there be, again, a new intifada? Will Hamas and its movement of despair and the Muslim Brotherhood spread into the West Bank? I certainly hope not. But that's the kind of thing that can happen uh, here. Okay, now, changing gears. We've got to talk about currency chaos and the international financial system. We have just been through a wild roller coaster week. Uh, you're aware that the moneyed power, right, the power of organized greed, the power of organized money has been pressing the intellectually weak uh, leadership of the Federal Reserve under Janet Yellen, and remember, as subliminal man would say, topley for fethead, topley for fethead. Uh, Yellen, obviously uh, not capable of carrying out this job, has been making verbal concessions that they're going to raise um, interest rates. Uh, this is uh, supreme folly. Uh, if 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 they raise interest rates and that's all they do and that's all they are going to do uh you're going to get a very very serious uh, outbreak of world economic depression as we've seen with the currency chaos of this past week dollar down against the euro two percent one day and then up two percent the next day back in a minute welcome back to uh, world crisis radio now where we're unfortunately not able to have Michael Chiotinas with us last week, and I know that uh, I know from the uh, communications I've been getting that people miss him uh, very much. So he's back with us this week. Uh, it, it really had is something to do not so much with the uh, the political situation or economic, but the uh, Eastern Standard Time to Eastern Daylight Time change. Now we have had Merkel, as far as I can see today. Merkel says every paragraph of the original uh, extorted memorandum of the Troika has to be respected. And we've had uh, Varoufakis saying, the, that is the Greek uh, finance minister, that it's really uh, the interest of these Frankfurt banks to keep the euro on the edge, a permanent crisis that uh, makes people frightened to leave their money in uh, in any of the other uh, banking centers, right? Be it Paris or or Rome or or Athens or whatever it is. No, uh, they have to keep it in Frankfurt because of the fear of these other countries uh, going into a crisis mode. So uh, obviously, we know that that Merkel, very much a creature of um, of uh, Josef Ackermann of Deutsche Bank, that's who put Merkel on the map. So uh, we shouldn't forget that. But let's let's go to Athens and Michael Chiotinas. Michael, welcome. Uh, hello, Webster. <coughs> and so what, what, what's the picture? That's exactly right. What you said. The the thing is that, um, as you said, the the euro is not really a currency. There is no real uni unity in the euro because a euro. If you have a euro in a German bank, it has a bigger expected value when the blackmail of a Grexit or a Euro breakup is uh, over our heads. It has a bigger expected value than a Euro, than one Euro in a French bank. And one Euro in a French bank has a 
a greatest expected value than a one euro in a Spanish bank, and so on down the line uh, until you come to Greece, where um, people are taking their money out and sending it to Germany. So, what they're trying to do, I, 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 I told you before that they are trying to have all the benefits of having the euro in the in the industry and uh, exports, but none of the um, and also all of the advantages of not having a euro, so of, of having a threat over our heads, and so they can take all uh, uh, capital uh, flows into Germany and benefit the bankers who use the uh, liquidity to, I don't know, spe- to maybe take themselves out of bankruptcy, bankruptcy because the, the, the big banks, as we know, as you have told in the past uh, many times, are to- completely bankrupt. So, uh, what they're trying to do now, as you said, Merkel says uh, the, the previous uh, memorandum has to be respected. That's crazy. <laughs> they're trying to, practic- to practically annul the agreement of the 20th of February w- within a cloud of blurriness and discredit, uh, discredit the, the Greek government. Um, they are also trying to maybe if they can, if they can do that, the bottom line, they want to, they, they want to co-op Syriza. Okay. Uh, bring them in line. Uh, force, force them to continue the old program as if the elections were never held. And, right. and if that proves impossible, and maybe, maybe give them, maybe give them some points, you know, uh, tax evasion and these, these kind of things. We don't care. We Germans don't care about, um, whether you um, crack down on tax evaders, uh, but everything else must be respected. Well, no. An election was held. We are saying no to austerity because we are trying to say no to depression. So if this proves impossible, if a co-op of the Syriza government proves impossible, they will try to overthrow the cheapest government. The cheapest government. And I think they're, 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 they will try and do that after and only after their absolute best, doing their absolute best to humiliate it. It's a an essential part of it. They are trying to humiliate the Greek government and then overthrow it. They don't want to have it the other way around because Syriza right now is leading in the, in the polls by 20 points, 20 percentage points, <coughs> much, much uh, more than uh, it took in the elections. So... Uh, Okay, so the the model is to is to co-opt, in other words, force Syriza to become the enforcer of austerity, discredit Syriza, and then once they're discredited, junk them, throw them away, and so forth. Yes, and and it's not it's not about Greece. They don't they don't really care about Greece. I think they're trying to um, establish superiority. They establish um, control over. Uh, policy in Europe in general. So they are trying to um, avoid having other countries turn to left governments and stop austerity. They want to mm-hmm. be the absolute um, controllers. And when I say uh, and that's the Germans, and when I say the Germans, by uh, by uh, I, I I don't do not mean emphatically do not mean the Greek the the German people not the German people not the um, the unions and all this that's the the, uh, the current German government controlled by German elites and we all know Germany has been a victim of um, manipulation by its elites for decades now. And mm-hmm. we had some very bad examples of this. Okay. Now, um, I don't know if you have any questions. Yeah, let me start. Uh, I have heard something here about uh, Tsipras going to Moscow earlier than thought. It was supposed to be May 8th for the victory parade, but there's been some talk of going earlier, maybe even April 8th. Does that uh, ring a bell? I haven't heard of this, but... The thing is, we are trying to get a European solution. Uh, I don't know what uh, role can Russia play in this. 
because we, the Greek government doesn't even care about money. As the Varoufakis said, <laughs> in a, jokingly, in a journalist, uh, he answered with a Beatles uh, uh, lyrics, uh, saying, uh, money can buy you love. And that's absolutely right. We don't care about money. The Greek government doesn't care about money. Um, they care about a, a policy, uh, a shift in the policy implemented. And uh, the Greek uh, government doesn't even uh, need um, money to pay um, the internal needs. It has a primary surplus, so we don't care about that. Uh, we, the, the Greek government cares about uh, repaying um, bonds just in the just as long as long as they are trying to use a default to bring panic and an overthrow. Otherwise, they don't care. They will default. The Greek government will uh, declare a default or a, a death moratorium. And sure. And of course, that's not the same as leaving the euro, is it? You can be broke and still be a European. Uh, Michael, look, here's what I have. Uh, Reuters. Reuters of Tuesday, March 17th says uh, Tsipras will meet Putin in Moscow on April 8th, uh, originally planned for uh, May 9th. That is the, the victory in uh, World War Two. So I don't know whether that's been denied. But the idea then is that we have some Eurogarchs and Eurocrats who are hysterical about the idea of Russia somehow strengthening the Greek position. And I would, I mean, what we've been campaigning for here as much as I can is uh, somebody should extend a, uh, a bridge loan, right, what Greece asked for, uh, 10 or 15 billion dollars. The U.S. Fed could do that in the twinkling of an eye. Or the BRICS Bank, right? Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. Webster Topsy reporting from Washington, D.C. And we're on the line with our uh, preeminent observer in Athens, Greece, Michael Chiotinas. Michael, I was just saying that uh, we had, uh, we had uh, the Greek defense minister saying that he'd, he'd like to get some financing from Washington. That would make a lot of sense, right? It's a... It's a NATO country. Why not get some benefits for once? Another one would be, uh, if that fails, then the BRICS, uh, the BRICS Bank, right? What's the BRICS Bank? It does it exist? And if it does exist, it ought to come out and, and extend a significant loan to Greece. That would obviously benefit the position, but it is, it does seem to be April 8th. Yes. Um, yes, but I don't have much about uh, on this front, although uh, the Tsipras government is trying to play the Russian card again and again, and uh, I don't know what form could that take, a uh, loan maybe, but I'm not sure, Other, um, anyway, the... Michael, the other, the other thing about this is we, we knew... Even before the last elections, right, it, it, last year, let's say, a year ago, that Tsipras had started contacts with Putin about if NATO tries to have a coup d'etat, will you provide certain kinds of aid? And it looked like Russia said, yes, they would. Yes. Okay, now, let me ask you another one that's made some, some important news. The humanitarian law, in other words, the, this question about these people whose whose lives are in danger, right? The 300,000 with no electricity and so forth. Can you give us an overview of that legislation? In other words, what exactly the Greek parliament has approved? It's um, some aid to uh, people <laughs> under the poverty line and to people who don't have electricity because electricity is cut if you don't pay your bills. <laughs> and and um, it's somewhat modest. The numbers are not too big. Uh, it's electricity, food, and some housing for families. And it's the, the this uh, legislation puts the responsibility to ministers to uh, adjust the numbers as are going to be needed. So that was a way of not having the 
of not having in the legislation in the legislation um, numbers that could be misinterpreted as defense as a deficit spending. In other words, mm -hmm. and they say, okay, if we uh, we can take in money, we we will uh, give more to this. But if we don't, we will we'll just stay at this uh, at the poverty line. And the interesting thing here is that Declan Costello of the European Commission, a representative of the old Troika, <laughs> if you if you don't believe right. me, uh, has um, sent a letter before the signing of the bill, saying before the passing of the bill, saying that uh, if the, the government, if the parliament passes that bill, it will be a unilateral action <laughs> against the 20th of February agreement, February 20th agreement. And, of course, the Speaker of the House said, you know, the legislative initiative of the Greek parliament cannot be blackmailed. I'm sorry, we, we, we will, will not tolerate that. And they passed it anyway, and nothing happened, of course. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's... But the, you, you see that they're trying to put pressure again and again and again. And at the uh, at the absolute uh, point of um, they they're trying to put pressure at the limit, so they can get whatever they can get, and maybe have Syriza confused or uh, economically asphyxiated and. Um, Surrender to Berlin, but it's not going to happen. And I don't know uh, uh, what they're going to do afterwards. They, they, their view of Europe seems to be that it's some kind of a penal colony, right? That it's a, yes. it's a, it's a form of hell on earth. And uh, I don't know. Uh, it, it, it does raise some questions about the mental stability of uh, of Merkel and and maybe even more of Schäuble, right? Who seem to be uh, apoplectic, right? Maybe he's, maybe there's, uh, some, um, you know, early onset dementia going on with, um, with, with Schäuble, because he doesn't seem to get, uh, reality. Now, I, I couldn't conclude, uh, our talk today without asking you about this, this propaganda campaign mounted by the Anglo Americans about Varoufakis making this coarse gesture with his hands and fingers. Uh, against, I guess, the uh, the Berlin regime of uh, Merkel and uh, Schäuble. You have any comment on that one? Yes, what? But the video is, is fake. Okay, is it's a, a German satirical show uh, came out and said <laughs> we we made it. We made the video. Okay, but the audio is uh, original. He says and um, stick the finger to Germany, but he he. he he talks about a period uh, at the beginning of 2010 that uh, Greece uh, didn't owe Germany one cent, uh, and he simply said, "We will, we should have defaulted," and stick the finger and say, "You can solve the, the Euro problem by your own." Uh, he he that he didn't say that to the German people or the German taxpayer. They're trying to make it seem like. He uh, stick the finger to the Europe to the German taxpayer. He didn't. He stick the finger to the, to the German elite. But he didn't even. The video is fake. But the audio is uh, original. All right. But now look. When you say um, this stuff with finger, I mean there is this other closely related uh, idiom, at least verbally, right? Is you you stick your finger in somebody's eye. You can give somebody a finger in the eye, and that's that's you know uh, uh, not not so uh, provocative, I guess. Is this. Or point them, or point the finger. He yeah, you can point the finger point exactly. Finger. So, um, yeah, so this is a big uh, it's a big fraud. And again, I I would recommend people in Greece. I mean, the the thing to hammer on is that Merkel is a creature of the Deutsche Bank. Of this guy Josef Ackermann, that's who made her. Right, she's there because of Ackermann's support, and 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 that, of course, of a couple of other uh, top bankers. The only other thing that I would um, 
I would be interested in finding out maybe for future weeks is as, I'm, as I have said, right, as somebody who has organized in Europe myself, uh, the one thing you have to understand after the Treaty of Rome, country by country organizing doesn't work. And what we're seeing these days, I don't think it has anything to do with insufficiencies of Tsipras or Varoufakis, but that they were stuck with a one-nation political force. What they needed was an international party, obviously in the European Union and maybe outside of it too. Um, Is there any awareness that that somehow needs to be dealt with? I mean, I I followed what they did in – in Italy last year for the European election, and they got a, a collection of very dubious characters who nevertheless had names, but they uh, they were inadequate. They just barely got got over the uh, the hurdle, right? The minimum number of votes. Any any discussion about going international, a, a, a kind of a Syriza international? That's uh, that's a very good point. There are some voices, but there are very few, and it's difficult. <laughs> to organize in a European uh, level, but uh, there are a few voices. I have written about it, and I think that you're absolutely right. We, we cannot be true Europeans. We cannot be uh, Europe without a European uh, unemployment fund or European trade unions and uh, sure. European uh, minimum wage, anyway. Exactly. Okay, the music is telling us we're finished. We'll see you again next week, Michael. All the best. Thank you. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. Webster Tarpley here in Washington, D.C. Now we're very pleased to uh, to bring you an interview with a uh, political candidate for the current year. That is to say for 2015. Political stirrings are starting. Primary season coming up. And we're very happy to bring you in, uh, a talk now with uh, Adam Rodriguez. Adam Rodriguez is a candidate for the county commission of Monroe County, Pennsylvania. Monroe County, Pennsylvania is the uh, area of the Delaware Water Gap. It's on the New Jersey border, and it tends to function as a kind of dormitory suburb for New York City. And Adam is looking forward to this county commissioner race in the Democratic primary, and that's going to be held on the 19th of May. So, um, Adam, welcome, and tell us Thank you. tell us about your campaign. Sure, sure. Well, this is this is really great to uh, be on here, Webster. Thanks for this opportunity. Uh, the campaign is going well. Initially, uh, I was uh, thinking that I was going to be able to walk on the ballot. But uh, at the very last minute, uh, two candidates popped up, and uh, so there's going to be a primary. So we're in for a fight. Uh, you know, this is uh, really uh, it's, so, it's such an opportune uh, situation for my, someone like myself running, because as you know, as some of your listeners may know, I did run for Congress, and unfortunately, I, w- I fell short of the thousand signatures by about a hundred. And so this time around, we're already on the ballot. I got my team out. I got a crew of people that are very uh, are, are great. They're they're loyal to me, and they're uh, they're out working hard. Um, basically, <laughs> the county commissioner's position in uh, in this in this county that we're in, like you said, we're in Delaware Water Gap. So this is a prime example of what can be done with with the uh, type of economics that. You know, I've studied the American system and that we, uh, we've talked about before on this program. And because the reason for that is, you know, it fits right at the gap. Now, the gap is going to be traversed at some point again with rail. Right now it's not, but it must be traversed in order for the United States to really uh, grow, economically speaking. And uh, it's, it's, it's a vital, it's a vital junction because, you know, the gap is pretty narrow. It, it's, a, it's a mountainous region. It goes into the Poconos, it's the western, the eastern Appalachian Mountains. And uh, at one time, it was, it was, um, there was rail, and that was key for the uh, United States victory over over the Nazis and the Japanese in World War II, because most of the material came out of the Scranton area. Now, 
that's been shut down since the early 1970s. There's been no rail. And it's my goal as one of the things that I'd like to promote as county commissioner, promote, because I, I do not have jurisdiction over this, but I can work and agitate for rail, which would not only benefit a lot of the commuters in my area, but it would turn, it would turn Stroudsburg into a transportation hub that would be basically the eastern capital of Pennsylvania. So I'm deeming part of, part of what I want to deem my campaign is as goes Monroe County, so goes the United States because it's not only going to be rail, it's going to be high-speed rail, and it's going to be maglev rail. And quite frankly, maglev rail cannot go through the gap at normal speed, so therefore it's going to have to be traversed over the gap, which means either a bridge or maybe even entertaining the idea of a dam, which was at one point under the WPA program supposed to take place, and that never happened. And that was supposed to extend all the way 40 miles, all the way to the conjunction of New, of New Jersey, Pennsylvania and um, and and um, New York up by Port Jervis. That's how long that dam, that that reservoir would have been, and that dam would have supplied power, cheap hydroelectric power at a high headwater dam for hundreds of thousands of people in that area. Instead, they're having to rely on natural gas. They're having to rely on electricity. It's expensive. It's onerous, and it's just cumbersome. So. We need to get back to that kind of thinking in that area. And, you know, the county commissioner's race, I'll tell you, this is a tough race. You wouldn't think that a local municipal race, this is a municipal race in an off-year election. And the way it works is there's three county commissioners. I want to be one of them. Two can either be Democrat and one can be a Republican, or it can be two Republicans and one Democrat, depending on how the voters come out and who they want to vote for. So in the primary, we're putting forward our two candidates, of which I will hopefully be one of them. Now, um, you know, I'm I'm really hoping to do a fundraiser this month. We're getting out. We're we're doing we're doing a grassroots canvassing campaign. We're going to get out. We're going to put these flyers out saying, "Come out and vote for me." Here's why I need to vote for me. And I'm also running as a team. Actually, this is the this is unique in the state of Pennsylvania. There might be one other county commissioner's team running in the state of Pennsylvania. You guys remember, Pennsylvania has nearly 60 counties, some of which have home rule, which is a different structure than the three commissioners, but there's only four. So, but at any, any rate, there's only one other, I think, county where they're actually running as a team. So my teammates, Andre Reams, he's a great guy. We're, 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 we work very close together. They've tried to divide us. They've tried to divide and conquer, and it's not going to happen. So, uh, you know, the race is on, the fight is on, and I look forward to it. I'm talking to people about the idea of national banking. I'm talking to people about... Adam, I'm, I'm sorry, we're going to have to uh, wrap it up, but please quickly give us the way to contribute. Very quickly, oh, how can great. people contribute, yeah. and we'll get you please. back next week. Please, this is key. If you want to contribute to my campaign, the website to go to is adamforcommissioner.com. And um, there you can find a PayPal. We're going to have an Act Blue button. Or you can go also to my, uh, my Facebook page, and we'll have a link to the, um, to the website there, and that'll be that's A-Rod or Commissioner on Facebook. Okay? A-Rod! So it's, yeah, A-Rod. <laughs> so, so, again, it's adamforcommissioner.com, and that's my, um, that's my web address if you want to go and donate some money there. You know, Adam, I'm, we've got in. Reverend Pinckney, and I'm going to have to go to Reverend Pinckney. If you can stay around with us, it's oh, great. Yeah, we sure. can, we can finish up with That'd a couple of minutes. Why don't you listen yeah, sure. in? But we've got to we've got to go to Reverend yeah. Pinckney because he's of course calling from jail, and oh, his course, time is uh, is very limited. So let's now, if we can, bring on Reverend Pinckney. Reverend Pinckney is here. Hi, Reverend Pinckney. Welcome. Welcome, welcome. You said I'm so calling good from you can be on with us. I'm calling from the penitentiary. <laughs> yes, we know. Uh, is that still that cold water facility? Absolutely, absolutely. It's it's uh, it's, it's it's called the cold water facility, and it's uh, located in Cold Water, Michigan. And believe me, it's not a jail. It's a penitentiary. That's exactly what it is. And they got all kind of rules here that you need to talk, we need to talk about. But let me, let me say this first of all. It's very, very, very important that people understand that we the people have to stand up 
and fight back. We cannot allow this to continue. You know, we're getting close to 3 million people inside this prison system here in the United States. Somebody got to say enough is enough. And I, I want people to understand so they get the drill. Because a lot of times people say, oh, they belong in prison. or people. But, hey, I know I don't belong here. I know I shouldn't have been here. But unfortunately, I'm here, Webster. But I just want to throw that out there to people so people can understand how serious it is for people to be in prison and nobody doing nothing. It's, it's a tremendous scandal, Reverend, and we're trying to, uh, to make the world, uh, aware of it. Um, what, if you just want to refresh our memories now, for people who might not have been with us last week, the next, um, what can we say, nodal point in, in your case is coming up in, what, a month or so? April, April the 14th. April the 14th, and what will happen April on April the 14th? April 14th at 8.30 a.m. in Barron County, Michigan Courthouse. Uh, that will be my next court date, and uh, we're getting ourselves prepared to go forward and move this thing to a whole different level. So Reverend, people can understand. One second, I'm so sorry. We've got a hard break. We can't overcome it. We'll be right back. All right. Okay, welcome back to World Crisis Radio. Webster Tarpley here in Washington, D.C., and we're going to go right back to Reverend Pinckney. So, Reverend, getting back to you, April 14th in Berrien County. That is correct. At 8.30 in the morning in, in Judge Sterling Chirac courtroom. We'll be there, and we'll be ready to take this thing to a whole different level. We will be talking about that juror, the one who became Facebook friends with one with the county clerk and did not say a mumbling word during the process, and she's trying to claim now that she don't know her. So, we're, we're, you know, we're, we're doing the things that need to be done to make sure that we bring this out and show them that they're done for the criminal enterprise there in, in Barron County, and they're sending people to prison left and right. We probably just, the Benton Harbor is a very small city, and we're probably the second largest prison population in the whole state of Michigan. Very small. And it's, it's, it's amazing how and what they get away with but, but I have to say this, Webster, we have to teach people to fight back and stand up for what's right. Because a lot of people don't understand how important it is. And it's important that we stand up and take a stand against this stuff. Absolutely. Now, uh, why don't you help us again? If it comes from you, it, it has that extra moral authority. How can people assist you? I guess it, it's first go to bhbanco.org and make a contribution on the PayPal. Absolutely. They go to bhbanco.org, and then they can get more information by going on my website and seeing what's happening. Or they can mail a check to Banco, B-A-N-C-O, 1940 Union Avenue, Benton, Harbor, Michigan, 49022. Because it's important that we have the resources to fight. And that's one of the things how to usually beat us down because we don't have the resources to stand up to this this madness that's going on here. And uh, uh, until people take a stand and understand that the people on the outside have to stop fighting for the people on the inside, then it's going to continue just this way. And, and just like I said earlier, remember this. It's close to th almost 3 million people now in prison, more than China, who has a billion people. And yet people are not standing up saying that something is wrong with the system because they are able to do whatever they want to do. And I'm just sick of it. I'm willing. I have made the supreme sacrifice. I have sacrificed myself so other people, so other people could stand up and understand the problem that exists here. Nobody would ever talk about the prison system if I wasn't here. So by me being here, I get a chance to expose some of the corruption that exists, not only in the courtroom, but also here in the prison system. Because anybody who's willing to eat this food that they, they distribute, you almost got it. It's killing you. Medical care is killing. You can easily die in this prison if you ever get sick. So we do have to be aware of that. Reverend, uh, we know that one of the uh, one of the key figures in uh, this machine that has framed you up is the Whirlpool Appliances Company and the uh, the patriarch, the owner. We think of that entire thing in some way or other is Congressman Fred Upton, and this he's in. The public eye, uh, in his capacity as the head of the House Energy Committee, 
and somehow he's got something to say about the um, the, the austerity plans that are going through uh, the the Congress. And uh, so what we're seeing is the same the same gang that imposes uh, you know this privatization, gentrification, hyper austerity in uh, Southwest Michigan, where you are. Uh, they're also part of the big austerity machine in Washington, D.C. So this is a very big fight. Absolutely. And, and here's the thing that a lot of people don't understand. Uh, when you talk about Fred Upton, he's a U.S. representative who don't represent the people that live in Benton Harbor, or <laughs> I could say the people of color. They don't get this is one of the things that he don't do, and nobody ever said anything about it. I always stood up to this man. Just, just. Matter of fact, in 2008, I believe it was, I ran against him for U.S. representative. So, and just to show you what I, we can do, if we stick together, if we do what needs to be done, it doesn't make a difference whether you're white, black, Mexican, Puerto Rican, Chinese, it doesn't make a difference. The key thing is that we come together because it's more of us than them. Once we get that in our heads that it's more of us, we can win these battles. We can't win until we get it in our head. This government is not here to protect you. They're not here to protect you. And you got to think about what they're really here to do. You know, they don't care if everybody is behind these barbed wire fences. They don't care if every single person that's in this country is behind these barbed wire fences. That's the billionaire. That's the, these uh, corporations. They're in total control of everything. Until we, the people, stand up and say no more, it's going to continue like this, Webster. This is why it's so important to be on your show talking about this, telling people about what's going on, and telling them about this prison system and exactly what they're doing. So, again, everybody should go to BH Banco. I think it's Black Autonomy Network of Community Organizations. Am I right? Yeah, that is correct. BHBanco.org. BH, Benton Harbor, Banco, B-A-N-C-O dot org. And you look over on the right, sort of in the in the lower right hand corner of the first frame, you see, and there's a PayPal. So give and give generously, because this is the ability to to wage a legal defense. And we know it. I should repeat this again. We know from a, a, a an attorney with a lot of experience that the only hope of making this frame up stick by this Upton whirlpool political machine is to uh, essentially wage a war of attrition. Uh, exhaust our resources and just force us to give up in despair. So despair is our main enemy, and the way you fight despair is, frankly, with money as well as with political support. And, and Webster, you are absolutely right on point, and it's important that we get the word out. And here's what I would like for people to do. I'd like you to go out there and start emailing people, tell them about the conditions here, not only at the prison system, but also in Barron County and around the state of Michigan. So people can understand that it's just not all about Reverend Payton. It's about the future. That's what I'm dealing with. It's about the future. You have to go on that Internet and spread the word. We're not talking about these things as a bit. We refuse to say things. Very people talk about the prison system because they believe that the prison system is here to protect them. That's not true. It's not even about you. It's about these corporations, these billionaires. This is what the prison system is about. You know, they make more money with these people being in prison, these corporations. That, 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 that's why people are You have prison. one minute one. remaining. I'm down to one minute, and, 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 and I got to tell you, Webster, it's an honor and a privilege to be on your show. And please tell everybody, get on that, get on that computer and start emailing people. Tell people about what's going on. Not just uh, uh, in, in, the, in the state, but not just in Barron County. Uh, it's, it's everywhere. Unless the people decide to make a stand, they w it won't happen. So we, I need everybody not only to go to bhbangle.org, but I need you to make sure that you spread the word, which is even more important. And I just want to thank you so much for this opportunity to be on your show. It's a privilege, an honor, and uh, I'm looking forward to next Friday uh, to even be, give you even more information. And we get closer to April the 14th in Barron County, where I have my hearing, and we'll be prepared. we got to be prepared. We can't go in there thinking that it's going to be pieces of cream. I'm not expecting a miracle, but I know that God can do anything. And thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Webster, for having me on the show. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. 
again, Edward Pinckney, a great voice in a great cause, one of the more, most courageous people I've ever met. Uh, and we've got to do anything possible to get him out of jail. But now we want to thank uh, Adam Rodriguez, candidate for county commissioner in the Democratic primary of Monroe County, Pennsylvania, on the 19th of May, for patiently waiting because of the exigencies of uh, Pinckney, uh, who obviously can't choose the time that he's going to come on. Let's just let Adam uh, say a few closing words and then again tell us, sure. remind us, how can we support your candidacy? Sure. Well, like, like I was saying during the break there, I kind of got cut off with you, but <laughs> how ironic if I were to be elected that we're actually going to have, you know, in the state of Pennsylvania, a candidate running explicitly on the ideas of national banking and the American system, which of course was founded from a, from a you know, Back in the 1850s with Henry Carey, right, right out of right out of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. So it would only be appropriate for for me to be able to come in as county commissioner and agitate for things in the county that I know that the state and federal government can get. And if I, and if they say, well, where's the money? I said, well, haven't you created a national bank yet? Or you got to get with the program, you know. <laughs> you know, that's, that's also reality. let's that's not let's not forget Friedrich List, right? More that's famous course. out there in the big world. Then right. Carrie Friedrich List from uh, Reading, Pennsylvania. Reading, right from Reading, right from Reading. I've been down to uh, Northampton, uh, Beehive County, and they have exhibits going over the things that he's done. You know, he's, he does have quite a name, historically speaking, in that area. So there is a precedent. And, you know, that's the thing about this campaign is that even though it's a municipal race, I will be administering a $95 million budget. And, you know, that wields great power in that county. And think of it, if we were to do the things I mentioned before along the lines of bringing in rail to that area, I might, I can't, I can't, I can't, I don't have um, authority over that directly to, to start it, but what I could do as county commissioner is issue out all the contracts that are going to come from a national bank for all the construction, all the contractors, all the, all the electricians, all the plumbers, all the different trades that they're going to have to work with, I'll be in charge of that with, other, with my other two county commissioners. So it really is a great opportunity to, uh, to, to educate people along the lines of the American system and give them hope because there's a lot of despair out there, but I'm, I'm giving them hope. So the race was All right. I honestly Let's... think I can win it. Adam Ford, commissioner, if you want to donate to my fund, thank you very much. I'd appreciate it. Adam Ford, Commissioner, we're having a big fundraiser this month. We need every penny we can get to make this fight, so please go there and help me out if you can. Adam, uh, we're, we're very much uh, uh, in support of what you're doing. It's very important, and I would simply issue a standing invitation uh, just about every Friday between now and the 19th of May. You got it. Uh, you why got don't it. you come back and give us uh, an updated uh, report to see how this is I'll going, and people should you go. Yeah. Indeed, go to Adam for Pennsylvania. Is that F O R? F O R. Yes, Adam. Adam for Commissioner. A D A M F O R C O M M I S S I O N E R. dot com. And uh, you know, I'll come on. And I'll give you a blow by blow fight. It's, <laughs> it's a lot of fun. I got to tell you, it really is a lot of fun. I'm enjoying it. So okay, now this is this. also it's the good. famous A Rod, right? A Rod coming in. Yeah, I'm the original. I was born before him, so I'm the original. <laughs> <laughs> All right, congratulations on on, uh, on getting into the fray, and we're going to yeah, be sure. with you uh, every step of the way from now on. Thank you. Thank you. So Thank you. come it's back next pleasure. week. My pleasure. And you're an inspiration, Webster. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks for letting me reach out to your audience and, and have a great weekend. I'll speak to you soon, okay? Okay. Take okay, care, the Webster. famous A-Rod, Adam Rodriguez, again, County Commissioner, Democratic Primary, Monroe County, Pennsylvania, on the 19th of May. Now, switching gears, we've got to go to Chicago, and uh, we've got to look in on the Chicago mayoral campaign. As people know, it is... The incumbent, Rahm Emanuel, an odious Wall Street Democrat, uh, somebody who's got deep roots in the Clinton administration and the Obama administration, where he was, after all, uh, chief of staff, a very dark chapter. Uh, opposing him, a much more promising candidate, Jesus Chuy Garcia, uh, who is running with the support of a lot of the unions. So here we have the classic situation. The Wall Street Democrat, with all those 
big money connections against the populist, but the populist needs a program, and that looks like a job for the tax Wall Street party. So now we're going to be joined by a um, an observer, certainly, of the uh, political situation in Chicago that she knows very well. Uh, somebody who also intervenes, um, and uh, to get an authoritative take on on what's going on. We're joined by Emily Weber in Chicago. Emily, welcome. Webster, hi. Thank you for having me. Okay, so we're looking to you to get the lowdown and above all the sense of what to do. Okay, so the situation in Chicago is a couple years old. Um, I mean, it started with the Chicago Teachers Union strike in 2012. And that was kind of the first popular, um, you know, uh, sign of anger at Rahm Emanuel. The Chicago Teachers Union had a 90% approval rate by the union members and a 70% approval rate by parents across the city. Um, and Karen Lewis was the leader of the Chicago Teachers Union. She's a very strong, you know, very forceful person. And she led this gigantic strike um, against the mayor, and she won. And ever since then, uh, Karen Lewis has been kind of baited as the main opposer to investment banker Rahm Emanuel. And uh, Karen was going to run for mayor um, last year, and then circumstances came up. She had to drop out. And so Chewy Garcia is kind of her stand-in. Okay. So, now, there was a debate between Chewy Garcia and Rahm Emanuel, and the reading we had here was, that uh, Chewy uh, fared uh, not as well as he could have because he did not have that indispensable answer. Uh, if you've got uh, pensions and other payments to make uh, and you want to maintain those, how do you get the money? Do you raise the sales tax? Uh, do you add new categories to the sales tax like services, uh, lawyers' fees, things like this? Do you increase the, the other main source of revenue, the real estate tax or homeowner's tax, or do you bring up something like, well, the Wall Street sales tax in general, but since it's Chicago, the LaSalle Street, right, that famous thoroughfare that goes through the financial district there in the loop, that's LaSalle Street. And what they've talked about is the LaSalle Street tax, which would fall on derivatives. Remember, the biggest river of money in the world flows through Chicago, and it's uh, the derivatives, and right now it's not taxed, right? So what's the action around the LaSalle Street tax? Yeah, that, that's absolutely right. We had a Chicago local member, Christian Pico, in the audience at the debate, and uh, his report was that Chewy Garcia did not have an economic program, did not have a response, um, uh, Karen Lewis does support the LaSalle Street tax, as does the teachers' union. So it's kind of a mystery why um, Chewy Garcia hasn't adopted the tax. Um, other Chicago locals, Dan Albanese, Kyle McCarthy, Christian and myself, are uh, trying to lobby the Garcia campaign to adopt the LaSalle Street tax as its central issue. And Chewy Garcia has two more debates. Um, the election is coming up really soon, and uh, Garcia is not leading in the polls. Ron is right around high 40s, even tipping into early in, into low 50s, um, and she was really just staying at the high to mid 30s. Uh, hang on, Emily. Hang on. The the music is telling us we've got a hard break. We'll be right back, and we'll uh, we'll hear more from Emily Weber in Chicago. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. It's already our last segment. We'll have to catch up on some of these other issues next week. We wanted to talk about the currency chaos of the last several days. Um, take a look at the website. Maybe we can write something up about that. But we've got this situation in Chicago. We're getting a report from uh, from Emily Weber. Emily, the, the, the our view uh, here from the Tax Wall Street Party was that uh, – if you look at de Blasio in New York, right, not not our favorite guy, but if you want to see how he won, the elementary thing was that he had a mass traction populist economic issue, which in his case was universal pre-K, universal preschool, universal head start paid for by a new tax on 
uh, people earning over $500,000. Now, that, there are a number of things we could say about that, but that's how he won the New York election. And Chewy doesn't have an issue of that magnitude. Am I right? That's absolutely correct, Webster. And it's it's quite ironic because Chewy should be winning this election. I mean, there's so much anger at Rom. The city is just so frustrated. You know, there's so much energy around anyone but Rom. And Chewy should be riding this wave. I mean, if he had a single point that was as strong as the LaSalle Street tax, or even if he just had more, um, you know, uh, specific mass traction economic demands that he was making widely available, people would jump on the board, but it, it's just not happening. But the other irony is, uh, on the one hand, the Chicago Teachers Union with Karen Lewis is the biggest supporter of Chewy, as I can see, um, and they support the LaSalle Street tax. Right? We have this very interesting speech made by Karen Lewis May of last year, it's a full-fledged um, uh, defense of the uh, Wall Street of the LaSalle Street tax, which comes not even in the form of a tax, but a fee. It's a fee on derivatives, contracts, futures, options, contracts traded, right? And remember, it's the Chicago Board of Trade, Chicago Board Options Exchange, Chicago Mercantile Exchange. That's the derivative center of the universe, and they don't pay anything, and it's unbelievable. So. That's uh, the one side. And then um, we're also told that there are a lot of aldermen, a lot of city council candidates who have been vociferously in favor of the uh, LaSalle Street tax. Can you give us some insight into that part, the other candidates that want this? Yes, it's true. I mean, there's been some, there's been some movement on the issue. There are a number of aldermen, um, aldermen who do support the tax. It's, it's really kind of a mystery as to why it's not, um, Garcia's central point. Um, it's, it's a mystery I'm trying to find out. I'm going to be, uh, meeting with some people in the campaign today. Um, and then I and the other, uh, Tax Wall Street Party Chicago local members are going to a um, meeting that the uh, Chewy Garcia campaign is having tomorrow, and we will talk about that exactly, and we'll see if we can get to the bottom of uh, what, indeed, Chewy Garcia's economic demands are and uh, how close they approximate the LaSalle Street tax. I I would have to point you in the direction of the well-known Al Capone uh, tradition there. In other words, uh, the... the, uh, The people involved in these derivatives uh, speculators uh, are not, let's say, they're not averse to making threats of violence against people who propose to curb their power. (laughs) I will, I'll be on the lookout. (laughs) It's the most obvious one, I'm afraid. Um, Otherwise, um, what else should we know? You should know that you can email the Chewy Garcia campaign with advice. And Ah. they read it. Um, So I have an email address, um, and then anyone who wants to can send them an email saying that you support the LaSalle Street tax. Great. Go ahead. Give it to us. And that's So it's tips at at chicago4chewy.com. Again, that's the word tips, T-I-P-S, at chicago4chewy.com. And so just send your email. Uh, yes, F O R, Chicago for Chewy.com. Okay. So send an email. You can go on Twitter. You can go on Facebook. I mean, the more people, you know, they have people in the campaign who watch these things. Um, so if, so basically we're just trying to communicate with the campaign members and get them to realize that their campaign is about taxing financiers. It's about taxing bankers. No, South Street tax is an answer for what they're trying to do. So we just need to let them know this, um, and then they can they can take it from there. I would also uh, maybe point to the fact that the Chicago Teachers Union Local 1, which as I understand it is the leadership of the union, have put out a couple of tweets. You can see these on uh, my uh, Twitter, right? Webster G. Tarpley Twitter that uh, they, uh, in one of them, uh, dated March 18th, uh, CTU Local 1 ba- backs mass traction demand for the LaSalle Street tax. Where are you, Chicago mayor? Uh, and then there's another one mentioning the 
the tax Wall Street party. So it looks like your efforts in particular are having some effect. Yes, um, in conjunction with another party member from Kentucky, um, we've been able to uh, kind of successfully move the Chicago Teachers Union Twitter campaign. And one of them was not just a retweet. Uh, the CTU union um, tweeted at Tax Wall Street Party um, without initiative. So they, they know about the Tax Wall Street Party. They know um, some of our platform. And if we can consolidate efforts, blast their email inbox, blast their social media, um, you know, Chicago locals will be on the board, on the floor here. You know, we're handing out flyers, we're tabling, we're taking emails, we'll be talking with people, we'll be asking questions to the people speaking at their conference tomorrow, or excuse me, their meeting. So if we can get a lot of movement from party members at CTU and at the Chewy Garcia campaign now, it is possible that we can take back this election. Again, uh, Garcia has two more debates, and if he mentions the tax Wall Street Party in very specific terms, if he can you know, come across as having a real economic program, then we've got a shot. Or the LaSalle Street tax. I mean, we're not going to, uh, you know, we'll, we'll take that too, right? In other words, he's got to, the thing is, though, he's got to have something that, that proposes to shift the tax burden off of the masses and on to the, uh, the, these, these uh, derivative speculators. And I'm afraid he's talked in the past about uh, reducing the pensions, right, and trying to argue to these policemen and firemen and other city employees. And that, um, and, and that will simply will not be acceptable, right? You've got to take it out of the hide of those derivatives mongers because God knows they've got one quadrillion dollars of derivatives going through their hands, one quadrillion, and they pay zero in taxes. And this is this simply, this is impossible. So, uh, Emily, um, that's that's a very Im- impressive uh, overview that you've got going there. Um, what I'm, I'm wondering, maybe you could send send a Twitter out that would uh, tell when and where you're meeting tomorrow because we have some supporters in that area. Maybe they'd like to come out and join you at that intervention. So why don't you, maybe you want to say it, say it now. We have a few minutes left, a few seconds left. Where are you going to be on Saturday? But mainly for their Twitter, right? Because this, this program won't be out there until tomorrow afternoon when you'll already be on the, on the hustings. Yeah. Okay. So tomorrow is the, Kind of big meeting for all the all the writers in Chicago who support uh, the Garcia campaign. We'll be meeting at the headquarters of In These Times, um, which is a uh, online news uh, source, and we'll be talking with MacArthur Foundation winner um, Alexander Heyman, uh, Sarah Paretsky. Uh, she does mystery novels. We're meeting with Carrie Litterson. This is the woman who wrote the book about Rahm Emanuel that's called Mayor 1%. Um, we're meeting with Tom Geegan, who's the labor attorney who represented the CTU union. And all of these writers will just be there. It's an author event in support of the Garcia campaign. And okay, and it's, where is it? Very quickly, where? It's at 4 o'clock on Saturday at 2040 North Milwaukee Avenue. Come from anywhere, 4 o'clock at 2040 North Milwaukee Ave in these times. And, and you write us a tweet about that, okay? Write us a tweet. Thank you, you very it. much, Emily. More power Thank to you. you. Thank Great you, work. Esther. See you soon. And that's the end of this week's World Crisis Radio. See you next week.